Well, again, this afternoon is my privilege to continue what we started yesterday. And I trust God for speed, even this afternoon. We began looking at covenant business startups. And um, we'll attempt to move further this afternoon. We're simply exploring the covenant strategies, covenant concepts, biblical steps to building organizations, companies, businesses, and all that. We stopped at, um, where did we stop? The voice of the Lord is the voice of breakthrough. Uh, studio, please help with the next slide. Yes, we got done with this. Next slide, please. Now, let's take off from this point. Engage the altar of prayer and fasting. We are looking at steps. God has given you a vision, given you an idea about a business. And you're trying to follow through. We're looking at the covenant steps. Engage the altar of prayer and fasting. And here we said... There are giants in everyone's promised land. And what are these giants out to do? They are out to stop our access to God's promise. Please hear this. There are challenges that will come. You can't run away from them. They are part and parcel of life's experience. Challenges. So they are called giants for the fact that God has promised you a beautiful adventure, a promised land, does not mean you will not confront oppositions. And what are these giants out to do? Stop our asses. And there are certain dimensions that will not just go except by the combined spiritual force of prayer and fasting. In Matthew chapter 17, from verse 19 to 21, they brought this challenged person to the disciples of Jesus. They are seeing Jesus heal, cast out devils, do all kinds of miracles. And they tried with all the gymnastics, nothing worked. When Jesus came, one sweep, the demon was out. And then, they came, then came the disciples to Jesus. Now, if you read this scripture carefully, they came to Jesus apart. They couldn't talk to him in the public out of shame. Can you imagine? You are a firebrand brother, firebrand chaplaincy person, and they say there's a demon possessed person, and they bring their own cry to you, hey, help us, help us. And you two, you come out with your broad chest, shaka, gaga. And then you blast in tongue, blast in tongue. The demon is just looking at you like this. Shut up. Somebody's praying, you are praying. Keep quiet embarrass you publicly in chapel. Then chaplain comes and says, now in the name of Jesus, out. And the, ah, and the demon leaves. You will go to meet the chaplain, not in public, inside his office. Chapel. Why didn't this thing work in our hands? The disciples were so ashamed. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Why? Couldn't we cast out this devil? Put that scripture back. And Jesus said to them, this kind. So there are certain kinds that will not respond except you have the combined force of prayer and fasting. Please hear me. There are certain dimensions of spiritual authority a believer will never touch without this spiritual force. So you don't like to fast. You are placing a limit. On the dimension of spiritual authority you can command. This commission, fasting commission from the beginning. 28 months before this ministry started, they were in a fast, praying. So as believers, as covenant people, we must engage the altar of prayer and fasting if we must secure some dimensions of spiritual results. 
Now, what does prayer and fasting do amongst others? Breaking forth of light. Break forth of light. Isaiah 58 and verse 8. Then shall thy light break forth as the morning. As a result of the fast. In verse 6 of that scripture, he said, Is this not the fast that I have commanded? So, you fast, you pray, light breaks forth. Because in the midst of a fast, every obstacle and barrier is cleared off. Now watch this. If Jesus had to fast, you and I cannot run away from it. Jesus, God in flesh, fasted 40 days, 49, before he kicked off his ministry. And you say, I don't need it. They said to Jesus, ah, we see the disciples of uh, John fasting, but your own disciples, every time we come, they are eating, 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 eating. And Jesus said, hey, don't bother. The time is coming. The time is coming. That day must fast. The bridegroom will soon be taken. And in those days, they must fast. So we are in the days of fasting and prayers. You want to secure higher dimensions of spiritual authority. And you need it. I need it. We live in a very wicked world. We live in a very fierce world. The business world is not a playground. People will do all kinds of things. All kinds of demonic things. So if you are not standing strong in your faith, they will blow you cheaply. But no one of us will be a victim. Come on, if you are saying amen, say it like a believer. Yeah. Isaiah chapter 60 and verse 1 to 3, Arise, shine, for your light has come. So in the midst of a fast, as light breaks forth, new ideas, new concepts, direction comes, instructions come. Now, what else will a fast do for us? It causes our lives to be as a watered garden. Huh. Watered garden. That is an end of dry seasons. Isaiah 58 and verse 11, the same chapter. As an aftermath of the fast, he said, And the Lord shall guide thee continually. That's my prayer for each and every one of you. As you step out from this ground, God will guide you. Come on, say a better amen to that. I say, God will guide you. He will show you the right steps to take. The right turns to make. Don't ever trust your judgment. There's a way that seemeth right to a man. All of the indices look correct, but there are ways of destruction. I put that scripture in Isaiah chapter 58 verse 11. Isaiah 58 verse 11. And the Lord shall guide thee continually and satisfy your soul in drought. And it will make fat thy bones and see the effect. While others are suffering from dryness, he said for you, you shall be like a watered garden. That's what we enjoy in this commission. When the ARC project began, a dollar was about 500, five something. Now a dollar is 1,500. So the budget of the project, maybe three times, but no feeling. So while others are crying out there, the commission, watered garden. No feeling that there's anything that has changed. There's a grace on this ground. I pray each one of you will carry that grace from here. So while they are saying there's a casting down outside you, you shall be shouting there's a lifting up. So all of these are spiritual steps, fasting and prayers. Don't run from it. You get out there and say, thank God I'm free. You have just got into the real life. You need spiritual authority. Next, engaging, the break, engaging breakthrough attitudes. Engage breakthrough attitudes. Now, it is often said that your, out, your attitude, I beg your pardon, is what defines your ultimate altitude in life. We we'll talk about attitude, mentality, disposition. And this is so crucial. Because as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Because as powerful as God is, God can't help a man beyond the way the man thinks. 
Philemon chapter 1 and verse 14. Without your mind, I will do nothing. I will do nothing. I am limited. The almighty God is limited by your attitude. By your mentality. You know, it's possible to go to Covenant University and not have a change in attitude. Mindset. Perspective. Meanwhile, someone else is living this place with a concurrent mentality and attitude. Another person is living with a defeatist mentality. And in no distant time, the difference is clear. Now, what kind of attitude must we possess? Number one, attitude to God. Perspective, what becomes your disposition to God? As you get off this campus, as you get to another phase of your life, what should be your attitude? Remember, we said seek ye first the kingdom of God. Matthew 6, 33, place God first. Let God be the number one factor, the number one force in every step, every decision you make. Seek ye first. God is too big to occupy second position. My glory will I not share with any man. No matter who you are, if you don't give me first place, I take no place. Your attitude and my attitude to God should be number one place. Number one. Number one. Lord, what are you saying concerning this step? Oh, this young man is hovering around me. He wants to marry me. Lord, what are you saying? Is he the right person? Oh, he goes to church, but, but, but one, but two, but three, but four. And your spirit man is giving you caution. And you say, Lord, by and by, anybody which can change, let him change before you enter. What is your attitude? When God says, stop there, do you say, Lord, mm, I think, give him first place. Number two, attitude to life. And I like this. Attitude to life. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 7. This is one of my most humbling scriptures. The Bible says, For who maketh thee to differ from another? If you understand this scripture, it will impart you with the spirit of humility and meekness. Who make it differ one from another? And what hast thou that thou did not receive? Now watch this. He said, now if thou did receive it, why dost thou glory as if you did not receive it? My interpretation of that scripture is that thank God for what you have. Thank God for who you are. You are simply a product of his grace and mercy. So your attitude and my attitude to life should be one of grace and mercy. It's a privilege that you are where you are. It's a privilege that you are still alive and well today. That I'm still alive and well today. So the attitude should be one of gratitude. Not an attitude of entitlement. If many of us think carefully, you discover that some of our peers in primary school, they, they never made it through primary school. Some died then. Some died in secondary. Have you ever wondered, Lord, why have you kept me? And nothing stops. I'm just coming now from a cemetery. A, service, a barrier was just being done now. That's why I came late. Nothing stopped. So attitude to life should be one of intense personal gratitude. When I see young people carry shoulder, you talk to them, they feel like, what are you saying? I say, mm. none of us is more than this. Bring the shoulder down. Humility, gratitude, that should be the disposition to life. I see beggars on the street. I say, Lord, I could have been the one there. People come helplessly begging, help me, help me. And you think because you have some money, you could have been the one on the other side and nothing would have changed. You know what Paul the Apostle said? He said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. 
It's all by his grace. In the same vein, you and I, we are where we are, what we are, by the grace of God. So when that mindset rules us, it keeps us continuously meek and humble. Attitude to life. Next is attitude to fellowship. They go from strength to strength. Psalm 84 verse 7. Every one of them, as they appear before God. Don't ever run away from fellowship. Thank God you are living Covenant University where you, you are compelled to come to chapel service. Now I'm free. I'm on NYC. I won't go anywhere. No problem. No problem. Your service to God is not adding anything to God. Nothing. My service to God adds nothing to him. Nothing. You know who gains from serving God? We do. You know who gains from fellowship? We do. Who goes from strength to strength? Man, not God. They go from strength to strength. Every one of them. Not God. God, God cannot be increased. He cannot be enhanced. He cannot be upgraded. He is I am that I am. He is the Lord. He does not change. He does not change. I said here yesterday, your choice to serve God or your refusal to serve God does not add or take anything from him. Oh, Lord, I will serve you. I am. Lord, get out. I will serve you. I am. <laughs> Are you hearing what I'm saying? He was before you ever came. He is now that you are here. And he will remain when we are gone. That should bring, it should bring every high shoulder down. It should break us in a state of meekness and humility before him. That when I stay in fellowship, I'm simply adding value to my spiritual life. I'm not doing anything for God. Oh, go to church. I'm not going to church. No problem. Don't go. You're going to church. It's not adding anything to God, not the church, but to you. My going to church is not adding anything to God or to the church, but to me. The value comes to me. That the man of God will be thoroughly furnished. Not the God of man. So, the attitude to fellowship, embrace fellowship. Long for it. I was glad the psalmist said, when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. You should be excited when it comes to going to church. You should be excited when it comes to adding and serving in the house of God. You are serving in the house of your maker, the one that holds your breath, the sustainer of your life. Finally, or next rather, is attitude to money. Money is simply an instrument. It must never control you. Never let money become your God or your motivation for living. Otherwise, the devil will take advantage of it. Money in itself is not evil. It is the love of money that is evil. Money is good. It takes money to live a good life. It takes money to come to Covenant University. It takes money to stay in Covenant University. Come on, is that true? Uh -huh. Many of you, you will have plenty of it. Uh, you didn't hear me well. I said you have plenty of it. I'm praying for just one person. You will never lack finances all the days of your life. Life is easier when you have it. Hmm? It's sweeter. You can wake up and go anywhere you want. Buy whatever you need. Provide for your family without speaking in tongues. There are some tongues that are not necessary. It's poverty that makes them speak that tongue. But when you are loaded, no shaking. May I pray, may this set produce the most financially buoyant group that Covenant University has ever produced. If you are part of them, let your amen be clear. Well, if your neighbor is not saying amen, you can collect the, the portion of your neighbor. Say loud amen. amen. You know, when I see in church, I see you prosper, you see them just say, it's a liar, they are broke, flat. I've been privileged to teach on financial prosperity in Wolfie for many, many years. Many, many years. 
When you are teaching them, the, the ones that pose like they don't need it. After survey, after the class, they will now meet you in the office. Sir, can I see you? Um, I have some challenger. And the way they were posing inside the class. Then afterwards, they are the ones that need the most. I'm praying for one person here. All the days of your life, you will never have financial challenges. Yeah. But what's the attitude we should have to money? Money is simply an instrument to fulfill God's plan for our lives. Never let money become your God. Never let money control your life. And this is crucial in our generation. When many are in a hurry to succeed, everyone wants to make it in time. So you see young people do all kinds of funny things. Internet fraud, yahoo yahoo, all kinds. All in a bid for money. And then from one trouble to another. That would be minus you. I said that would be minus you. Next, let's recognize the master key to breakthroughs. Let's look at that quickly. Recognize the master key to a world of breakthroughs. The master key to a world of breakthroughs. The truth is this, many of us have had this statement so much all through your sojourn here in Covenant University, that sometimes it's like it doesn't, it's just one of those statements. Seek first the kingdom. I've had it. I've had this since year one. I'm in year five. But have you settled down to really understand it? Have you settled down to appropriate it to your personal life? If you haven't, before you leave this ground, let God know that is number one. That's what is called scale of preference. The list of your priorities in their order. God is simply saying, if you want me to have you live a life of unending breakthroughs, just, just give me number one place. And all the things that other people are dying to get, not just material things, but immaterial things, peace that you can't buy with money, joy, that you can't buy from anywhere. Fruitfulness. There are many things money can't buy. And he said, no, all these things I will add. You will not need to pray for them. I was saying here, 20 years ago, around this time, I was on an adventure searching for the secrets behind the life of the chancellor. I don't know if I told you guys here. Going from the village to Quara, to Ilori, to Kaduna, asking questions from anyone I could meet. Tell me, how was he when he was growing up? Tell me. Around this time, 20 years ago, it was holiday time. I was in CU then. Spent all my money. Spent 50% of my school fees on top. <laughs> Searching for secrets. I never knew what life was organizing in the future. I was just hungry to find out that this kind of man, where ministry is working, every aspect is working. Like everything it touches turns to gold. Family life working. Children working. Finances working. Wife working. Total package. I said I like this one. Because you discover that some money may be working, wife is not working. Wife may be okay, children bunker. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Just there's just somewhere that there's a problem somewhere. But I saw an example of all round ministry, boom, finances, boom, everything. I said, I like this one. And because for every behind every glory, there's a story, right? And inside the story, there are what? Secrets. So when you see the glory, don't just celebrate the glory. Find out the story behind the glory. And when you find out the story, you discover the secrets. I said there that success will always leave trails and tracks. 
behind for anyone and everyone that is interested. That this is the way. Follow. So I went hunting. I went hunting. I went hunting. I came up with a book then. 20 years ago. Beautiful book. Like a mini biography. And I presented, to, presented it to the chancellor on the eve of his 50th birthday. That's one of the highlights of my life then. But one old woman misguided me. She took me to one church that she was working and I was following her with my friend. So I said, okay. We took a picture and we put it in the book, The Birthplace of Bishop. Cha -cha 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 -cha. Wrong location. When I presented the book to him, he was so intrigued. He said, how did you get all these stories? I said, sir, I went searching. I went hunting. I was proud of myself. Ah. He said, sit down. He went inside his office. After a while, I saw him coming out with a red biro. At that point, I knew I'd goofed. As he came out with red pen, I said, Steve. I said, yes, dad. Who told you I was born here? I said, one mama something. He said, ah, no, wrong location. Ah! I knew that book had died there. So I saw X, X in about two, three places. I just gave up. So he said to me, son, no man can tell another man's story better than the man. Don't surprise someone with his biography. You will miss it. <laughs> but you know the mystery of it? He said something to me that day. He said, when I'm ready to do my own, we'll work on it together. So years down the line, when it was set to start, we'll sit down, we'll be working on it together. I'll sit across the table. Up till now, he says, these are the areas I want to put. And I remembered what he said to me 20 years ago. But one of the greatest findings in my search behind the secret of his greatness, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all the things that the people in the world are struggling to get. God said, leave that for me. I will be adding it. You will not need to struggle for it. I will be adding them to you. So the master key to a world of breakthroughs is to give God first place in your life. Can I see you do your hand like this? Everybody, can I see you lift your, just the right finger? That signifies what? First. Who are you giving the first place in your life? Come on, say it. Let, let heaven hear you. Who are you giving the first place? Now, all the days of your life, who will occupy the first place? Your boyfriend? Your girlfriend? Who will occupy the first place? Now, say it as a covenant between you and God. Who will occupy first place? He has had you. May something else never take his place. Amen. This is so crucial. If you give him number one place, you will discover that the things that others are struggling to get, they will be coming on their own accord. On their own accord. No struggle. You only need to beg for them. You only need to beg for them. When God began to show him all of the prophetic landmarks of the commission then in his story he said there were 60 of them young boys and young girls just serving God passionate for God and God began to tell them in one of those prayer meetings this 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 ah, you build a tent I will sit 50,000 there was nothing like that anywhere in the world oh I saw wings in the air flying and he said what did they say they were aircrafts not aircraft aircrafts and the only car in that meeting was a run-down Volkswagen B2. Have you seen Volkswagen before? Has anybody here seen Volkswagen? May you not have it all. May you not ride that type. I'm talking about the, not the new model. I mean the old ones, the ones of the 70s. If you start it here, you may almost hear the sound. Which hall is this one here? Is it John? No, no. Esther, you start it. You don't, it, it is self-announcing. It was so embarrassing that when he's going for meetings and they invite him, they will tell him that, please, leave your car. We'll come and pick you. He said, no, I'll come. I have a car. He said, no, that's not a car. We'll come and pick you. Leave that. Is it Volkswagen? Leave it. 
That's how embarrassing it was. But this was a man serving God. God was number one. And God began to show him wings, aircrafts, church, 50,000, printing press, largest in West Africa, all big, big stuff. There was no sign that it could ever come to pass. So one day we traveled. We were in the helicopter, boop, 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 and we landed in the place. When he looked out the window, it was the same run-down primary school that God was picking those things we landed. And he looked. All of the things God was saying, donkey ears, when there was no sign that they could ever come to pass, they are now tangible in the hand. How did they come to bear? Give God number one place. You know what happens when you give God number one place? It takes away struggles. It eradicates struggles. God cannot be in front of you and you will meet any obstacle on your path. He said it goes before you. It makes the crooked way straight. It breaks in pieces the bars and the gates of brass and cuts in sunder the bars of iron. So what stops others from advancing? He clears them before you get there. There's somebody here, before you get to NYSE, God has gotten there before you. Yeah. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Upon your stepping foot in that place, you have taken over. Yeah. The spotlight of heaven will rest upon you there. Yeah. While other coppers are struggling to get placement, placements will be begging for you. Yeah. While they are posting them to interior villages, round down schools, God will give you a choice posting for you. All you need to do, let him know, Lord, you are number one place. And you maintain that place all the days of my life. Nothing will ever come and take you, take you, take you off that number one spot. Listen to the second first, the interest of the kingdom of God brings us under heaven's favor. Favor. And hear me, in these last days, the giants that God will be raising, one of the core factors for the making of end time giants is what we call favor. Favor. Psalm 44 verse 3. Psalm 44 verse 3. For they got not the land in possession by their own sword. Neither did their own arm, their strength save them. Huh. But watch this. It said, but thy right hand and thine arm and the light of thy countenance. Why? Because thou hast what? Favor unto them. Favor is the difference maker. It's the difference maker in life. It takes, takes struggles off your journey. It takes obstacles off your path. Every time I keep praying, Lord, more favor. More favor. There are times in the night, dead of the night. I remember those early days when I just began as a part-time pastor and I come to Canaan, 12 midnight, 1 a.m. I'm praying around, walking around Tabernacle and I'm saying, Lord, favor, 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 favor. That distinguishes men, favor. Lord, that will not make me struggle, favor. And some of those times you just finish praying into the night, following morning. Something just happens. You know this is the finger of God clearly. There are multiple, but it's you, they pick. Oh, you're the one going on this trip. You're the one taking this benefit. I know that's I want Is it the only one? Yes. Favor. 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 So when you see someone enjoying favor, don't be angry. You just want to collect your own. It's available. But one of the key assets to enjoying favor from God is seeking first his kingdom. Psalm 102, from verse 13 to 15. Thou shalt arise and have mercy upon Zion for the time to favor you. Yea, the set time has come. Get ready. The kind of favor you have never touched. The kind of favor no one in your lineage, your generation has ever touched. May God begin with you for concerning your generation. There's a prayer I keep praying for young people. I say, heights. 
that no one in your lineage ever reached. May you be the one to begin from that place. There are limitations in any lineage. There are boundaries in lineages. But you are ordained to be a Joseph and an Esther. You are to set new standards. The times I look, I stumbled on some documents of my late father. And I was going through them some months ago. And I was just looking. And I was smiling. Things that looked so big then. You don't need to even sneeze to do it today. Heights that looked so big then. Mega then. And I'll see him with his wonderful signature, sign those amount of money. And I smiled. And I said, a gap. Wow. And those were the prayers I used to pray those days. I said, Lord, heights that no one in my lineage has reached. Let me touch there. I pray that for one more person here. Heights that your parents never touched. Your uncles never reached. May God take you beyond those places. But it takes favor to get there. When doors just keep opening, no matter who is angry, doors just keep opening. Thou shalt arise and have mercy upon Zion for the time to favor her. Yea, the set time is come. Put that scripture back. Verse 14. Let's see what will trigger that favor. 14, please. For thy servants, do what? Take pleasure in her stones and favor the dust thereof. You favor his agenda, he lavishes favor upon you. You favor his interest. Your heart is panting after matters of the kingdom. Then God begins to lavish favor upon you. I did a test some years ago. And interestingly, the resident pastor also did something similar, but we never knew until it became testimonies. When the church just began building churches in rural, rural locations, I looked at my state then. I, many, many years ago, I, I knew I couldn't build one at that point. So I said to God, Lord, this is the advancement of your kingdom. At least I can buy some chairs. But I want to show you that I'm, ad, I'm part of those advancing your kingdom. So I bought some plastic chairs. That was where my financial status could take me then, at that time. I said, okay, church, these are plastic chairs. And I said, Lord, you know if you bless me enough, I will build and furnish. But now I cannot. But to show you my interest at my level, these are plastic chairs. I discovered after a while, there was enlargement in financial capacity. Ah, I bought more chairs. Then PA system, sound system to equip the church. Ooh, capacity is increasing. A time came. They said they were building one of the village churches and something happened. They stopped. I asked them, how much do they need to finish? A couple millions. Okay, finish. I discovered that the more I favored his cost, the more he enlarged my capacity. And before you knew, I said, let me try one. Pew. One. Ah, this is you. Let me try another one. Pew. Let me try another one. Pew. Now it is rolling. Because God is expanding capacity. But if there was not the, the first move for plastic chairs, it will never come. Why am I saying this? Start at your level. Just show to God that anything that pertains to his kingdom, your heart is beating after it. Yeah, God's servant says he wants to build a thousand churches before his time is over. Yes. Imagine you are carrying that kind of kingdom dream and God knows it is genuine. He will provide his resources for it. One day he came, he said, I'm doing hundred at once. Hmm. I said, okay, I'm doing one at once. <laughs> That's the level. No problem. We're coming. We're coming. After I said that, I went to my corner. I said, Lord, he has done hundred at once. I will do hundred in no distant time. One sweep. But now, let me do one so I don't wound myself. I started with one. <laughs> do you carry a kingdom dream? Or you are carrying your own ambition. In these last days, 
God is seeking for distribution channels for this end time wealth. May he find you. I said, may he find you. But one of the core, if you read Haggai chapter 1, carefully, he said, the silver is mine. The gold is mine. The glory of the latter house shall be greater than the former. So all of the things we are celebrating in the lives of our fathers, God is simply saying that in your time, they will look like nothing. And that's where we are going. May another man not take your place. Say an amen like you have faith this afternoon. So you can lay a foundation for a great future by a lifestyle of helping the needy. You are laying a foundation of a stress-free tomorrow. A great future. How? By helping the needy. Don't turn your back. Many of you, the monies you have, you can start paying school fees for less privileged children from now. You can. You can pick one. 50,000. School fees. Lord, as I'm helping this child that I know is helpless, see to it that in my lifetime, let thousands feed for my staples. And God sees your heart. He begins to expand your capacity. That's how our father started. There are professors in Covenant University. There's one, at least I know, that was on a scholarship in the 90s. Oh, you're angry. God is blessing him. There are things he started doing very early and he's still doing till now. Some of you are Dove scholars. Here. Every set, Dove scholars. You think he doesn't know what he's doing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's covenant sense. It's called covenant sense. May you have that kind of sense. You have people when need this, they, 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 those struggling come to them and say, I, I can't give you. No, I'm not giving. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> God has simply given you a platform for a rise. And you hold the two five in your account. No, 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 I won't give. And you stay there at that level. I began giving scholarship 2008 or nine, with two small children in Aqua Ibom. Uyo. That I met on the street crying. How much of the school fees? Two five. Government school. Then I picked up my wallet, gave the two senior and the junior. I said, "Go to school and pay." And as they were going, I saw them crying. Tears dropped my eyes, and I said to the Lord, "I want to give me the privilege to send thousands of children that I may never know through school in my lifetime." And I watched them walk back to school to go pay their school fees. Well, we are approaching 100 now, gradually. We should be getting to, um, I don't know the number, but we hope to hit 100 before September or before the year is over. Primary, secondary, university, polytechnics. <laughs> Multiples. But it started with two, two, five, two, five. If it never started, it won't get to where it is. And I'm already seeing the thousands. So whether you say amen or not, I've seen it. <laughs> I pray you also see something. No man arrives at a future he cannot see. You can't get there if you can't see it. So opportunities to help those in need, embrace it. You are simply rise, riding on that platform. To higher dimensions of prosperity. So don't turn your back when it's in your hand to help. If you study the life of Job, don't just read, read the Bible for, uh, as a storybook. The life of Job. Job was the greatest in his time. That means the wealthiest in the entire world. But check what was his secret. He was helping the needy, the widows. Those who had no one to help them. So the blessing of those that were about to be destroyed came upon him. How, do you know what it means to have a widow cry and pray for you? Crying just because of help you lent. In this kingdom, we prevail by blessings. 
<laughs> so every opportunity to be a blessing, embrace it. Embrace it. Now, let's close here and then we'll conclude the final session, the final class. Let's look at the power of relevant training. As you begin this journey to setting up organizations, setting up businesses, the power of relevant training. Don't go into any venture with common sense. Otherwise, you will have common results at best. There are too many common businesses everywhere. Make up your mind to be distinguished amongst your peers. Make up your mind to stand out. And one of the core secrets is to acquire relevant training. So go for relevant facts in your area of business. Check out organizations that have excelled. See the pattern they took. Read the biographies of men and women that have excelled in business. Don't just jump in. You know what you find in biographies? You find the secret of their exploits and how to evade the pitfalls that they suffered. Because biographies will document their strengths, their weaknesses, their successes, and their failures. So, so you follow the area of strength and avoid the areas of weakness. When God's servant, the chancellor, was to go into full-time ministry, he settled down to read 39 biographies. 39 of successful ministries before he went into ministry. So he had inside him the experience of 39 successful ministries. Meanwhile, somebody else will just wake up that God has called me. I have a great vision. Yeah, let's go and start. What are you starting with? Common sense. When challenges come, ah, how can I handle this? I don't know what to do. Meanwhile, somebody, someone else that has read the biographies of others, when challenges similar to the ones those ones were faced with, come at him. He simply applies the strategies that they followed so he doesn't stay long in that challenge. Meanwhile, somebody else is scratching his head. How do I handle this? Meanwhile, someone else has handled it and succeeded in it. When Covenant University was about to start, he settled down to study biographies of Yale, Oxford, all world-class universities before Covenant University started. So when Covenant University started, he said, this is another one, global institution, because he had already studied. Settle down. Acquire relevant knowledge. Don't work with common sense. There are too many common businesses everywhere. May your own be a different one. You want to go into fashion? You don't know nothing. You want to go into furniture making? You know nothing about it. There was a time the wealthiest man on the earth was a furniture maker. Furniture. You want to go into stocks? And you know nothing about it. You want to go to NFTs? You don't know nothing about it. Settle down. Acquire knowledge. And interestingly, in this generation, knowledge is open today. In fact, you don't need to pay so much. Everything is on the internet. But instead of you searching and reading relevant things, you are watching a movie. Assess the working knowledge of any, assessing the working knowledge of any business is what makes it work. There are too many strugglers. Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and verse 15. The Bible says, the labor of the foolish. Weary it, every one of them. Where is him, his relatives, his friends? Every one of them. Why? He does not know how. What you don't know, you don't know. What you won't learn, you can't know. So settle down and learn. Embrace biographies. Read leadership books. John Maxwell, Brian Tracy, read books. One of the greatest advantages we had in Covenant University, we used to exchange books those days. Oh, we read Maxwell books. Oh, we read uh, uh, Mars Moro's books. 
all kinds, leadership, personal development, all of those things became formative instruments that molded many of the graduates of Covenant University. But if you don't go for knowledge, you can't acquire it. Be intentional about going after knowledge. And I close here. Good understanding procures favor. In other words, questions? <laughs> good understanding attracts favor. So when you, until you can understand it, it cannot belong to you. There are too many people that are reading, but they don't understand. And until you understand, it does not belong to you. You can't possess what you don't understand. That's why I said here, good understanding will attract automatically. It attracts favor in your direction. It's my prayer. For every one of you that God has placed in your heart a vision for a business, a career, a venture, ministry, whatever God has placed in your heart, the relevant wisdom to excel in that calling, may you depart from this campus with it. Amen. Not one of you will fail. Amen. I pray for one person, I say you will not fail. Amen. If you are saying amen, say like a true believer. Amen. One more time, you will not fail. Amen. Where others struggle, you will triumph there. Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ. And so shall it be in Jesus' name.